the, uh, the presentation that I'm giving tonight is titled, Begin with the End in Mind. Alrighty? And uh, I just want to again say thank you to the whole Youth 2.0 team, this newer Inside Out team. I had an amazing session uh, when I was invited to be a moderator or an interviewer for the Youth 2.0 session about maybe four or five or six weeks ago now. Uh, and actually, after the session that I was part of, I was interviewing Dr. Shyam Bhatt uh, in India. He actually gave me a phone call. And one of the, the issues that we touched on on that call, oh, it looks like he's joined. Uh, one of the issues we had touched on on that call was really this enormous pressure that we both feel when we interact with young people, not only around the world, but in particularly in India. It's as if this modern life is happening so fast and young people there are trying to adapt so quickly and yet struggling to at the same time. And yet beneath this pressure is also this enormous promise and potential and opportunity. And when, uh, when Akshay reached out to me about giving this presentation today, I was so excited and it just seemed like such a perfect follow on opportunity. In fact, I felt like I was be given, being given an opportunity to expand further that discussion from Youth 2.0. So thank you to the team. You guys are doing amazing work and so much work as well. And I, I'm really grateful and appreciative of being invited here this evening to, to address everybody. So again, the title of this talk is Begin with the End in Mind, A Practical Guide. Alrighty? So the, the first thing that I wanna share is uh, just a note about the audience. So when I was first asked to give this talk, and in general, when I approach the youth programming, I, I try to be focused on who I'm going to be addressing. And for this, I was in some ways advised that it should be somewhere from like 15 to 30 or 15 to 35. And I really focused in on that. So if, if you are outside of that window, if you're north of 35, I still believe the content here will be uh, interesting to you, if for no other reason to help understand some of the pressures of those uh, younger than you. But I also think it could be relevant to you as well. But my, my focus was to really try and speak to that sub-35 audience. Whether or not I'm successful at that, you guys will let me know. But that was my intention at the beginning. Okay, and as, as Akshay shared, the, um, I'm going to close this real fast. Okay, as Akshay shared, these, all these sessions are based on the book, The Seven, Highly, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Interesting trivia point, this book was published the year I was born in 1989. And, uh, you know, it's, it's probably more successful than anything I will ever do in my life. I think it has 30 million copies now sold around the world, translated into Lord knows how many languages. So it's, a, it's an amazing book. I, I read it about 10 years ago when I was a uh, sophomore in college, either a sophomore or freshman, I don't remember. And since then, I've also suggested this book to many people, particularly those who are starting out on their inner journey, because this is a really practical but also grounded in reality guide to how to start taking those first steps towards working on yourself and, and developing the inner fortitude and inner strength and character to live a more meaningful life in the world. Also, not from the Covey Institute, but just by third parties, there are some amazing videos on YouTube that are synopsis of this book that I highly recommend that people check out and watch because you get to see how other people interpret the whole book, not just a chapter. And I think it's a great way to understand the depth of, of what this text includes. So in, uh, in accordance with the chapter title, Begin at the End, I want to start my presentation at the end, actually. And I want to share the key takeaways from the book itself. And the, the three, oh, I got some new messages. Everything's fine. Okay. So the, the key takeaways from the book are for this, for this chapter, for chapter number two, The Habit. Begin with the end in mind means to begin each day, task, or project with a clear vision of your desired direction and destination, and then continue by flexing your proactive muscles to make things happen. Two, there is a mental first creation and a physical second creation. The physical creation follows the mental, just as a building follows a blueprint. Three, if you don't make a conscious effort to visualize who you are and what you want in life, then you are, in the converse, empowering other people and circumstances to shape you in your life by default. And finally, number four, 
one of the best ways to incorporate habit number two into your life is to develop a personal mission statement. Now, I know that the youth team has prepared a really nice document for after this call to share with you that can actually help you in a practical way start to define and codify your own life statement, your own life mission statement. Uh, I have never sat down and actually done that step by step, so it felt a little inauthentic for me today to do that with you because I haven't done it in a formal way. However, at the end of the call, if you guys are curious, one of the last slides I have in the presentation is just sort of a one sentence value or guideline that I always keep for myself that I find helps motivate me as well as give me guidance. But I didn't want to walk you through that process because it wouldn't have been an authentic exercise because I haven't done it for myself. Now, as I shared, these are the key takeaways from the book. And if you search this online, you can read blog posts about this from the Kobe Institute itself or actually read the book. But when I was going through this, I actually, I had another thought and that was, when, when young people are gonna hear me say, begin with the end in mind, you know, you have to have the end goal clear before you start something. I, I, I actually thought that that's not what young people are going to hear me say, or I thought back to when I was 20 years old and I read this book for the first time, even though I could consciously understand what he was talking about, the way it was being filtered through my own experience was slightly different. And it was like this. <laughs> when I heard those things when I was younger, it felt more like, okay, so this means that I need to know exactly what I want to do right now in this moment so that I can make the absolute best decision possible. Because of course, there's only one possible decision so that the rest of my life, which stems directly from this important decision and vision can be the most financially, spiritually, personally fulfilling for me, my parents, my future husband and wife, my children and my associates. Now, if I don't know what I want to do right now, or if I don't have a perfect vision in mind, or even worse, if I make a bad or the wrong decision, then I must be fundamentally flawed in some way and will be a terminal failure until I inevitably die penniless and alone. Okay, so obviously I'm being a little bit dramatic with how I wrote that, but I'm sure some of you guys are smiling and laughing and shaking your head because when you, heard, when you saw me share those takeaways from the book, it's like, wait a minute, I have to know so clearly what I want to do, but I'm only 17 or I'm only 22 or I'm only 25. And, and what if I make the wrong decision? So that puts a lot of pressure on us, right? That means that we somehow, if we need to have that end in mind, in, in mind we need to know so much more than maybe we know right now. And, and even if we had a clear vision, we may not yet have the confidence to go fully in that direction of our vision. And so part of what I wanna talk about tonight, and listen, I'm, I'm not trying to say Stephen Covey is wrong. He sold 30 million copies. Obviously he's right about so much. But instead I wanted to, to give a presentation that could help young people approach this habit if they don't yet have that super clear vision. So let's slow this down together. Let's unpack it a touch more and let's see if we can get ourselves to that point of clarity on the vision. And even if we're not clear, still have confidence to take steps in the right direction. So again, with beginning with the end in mind, I wanna share what my key takeaways are, are for you today. And then I'm gonna walk through the rest of the presentation. So first, you have to chill out and you have to relax. And, uh, and I guess youth speak, we say chillax. Uh, very few people know exactly what they want to do with their life at a young age or virtually any age, actually. So you're not responsible for knowing exactly what you want to do, but you still need to be actively trying to figure it out every day. You're not responsible for having that super clear vision yet, but you are responsible for taking action to understand it. And attending seminars like this is a, an, amazing, an amazing first step in the kind of activities you can do. Number two is be bold. Don't let the fear of potential, fa of potential sorry, don't let fear of potential results prevent you from taking the first step. Trying and failing is always greater than, greater than failing to try. And the first step is always the hardest. And I'll come back to that in a minute because that's about confidence. And takeaway uh, number three is reflection FTW. I spend a lot of time on Reddit. So I always like the, the phrase for the win. Reflection for the win. The only way to get better at making good choices for your life is actually to start making choices for your life and then actively 
reflect on them. Experience plus active reflection is the best and only hack if you don't yet know super clearly who or what you want to be. So if you don't yet have that vision, this third point means that you can start to take small steps, but if you're actively processing your experience and thinking about it, then you're going to start working towards a larger vision because you're going to be building a series of, reflect or of, of decisions that are getting you closer to your goal. So let's get personal. I, I wanted to do something a little cool with you guys and, and get some feedback from the audience. So I'd like if everybody could please go to www.menti.com. And when you get to that website, it's going to ask you to input a number. And based on your age, I would like you to input a number. So I'm going to give you guys another second to get there. And if you are 15 to 22 years old, when you get to menti.com, I would like you to please put in this number on the right-hand side, 452205, okay? So this is for the 15 to 22 year olds, please. If you are uh, 22 to 28 years old, please put in this number on the right hand side. So again, menti.com, based on your age, please input this number. And finally, if you are 28 years old or 28 years or older, please put this number in on the right-hand side. And I'm going to give you guys uh, 20 more seconds to do this, and then I'm going to, to move on. So as, as you're getting this set up, Menti is a unique platform that we can use to get live feedback from an audience and display it graphically. So since we have a few different age groups represented, I wanted to ask everybody the same question and see if and how our answers differed across the ages. So I'm going to look behind my screen really quickly, and I'm going to make my screen a touch smaller. One second. So can you guys now see, oh, you guys are already starting to answer the questions. Great. Good, good, good. So the first question that I wanted to ask is, what is the most important life question you are trying to answer right now? And let me turn on my timer. I'm going to turn it on for 30 seconds. So the 15 to 22 year olds, we have career, what, I, what do I really want to become, future wife and career. The 22 to 28 year olds, what do I want to do next, job and relationship. What is my purpose in life, still don't know what's the purpose of my life. Okay, to the 28 plus we have goal of life, about my vision, how to focus and connect it to my higher self and accomplish my daily life. Okay, very interesting. We're seeing some overlap with the 22 to 28-year-olds and the 28 pluses and the 15 to 22-year-olds career job. Okay, good. Let's try the next question, guys. The next question is, and we'll go through these one by one at the different age groups. The next question, and I'm going to switch all you guys over, is uh, what is the hardest part of taking action or making a decision to solve that biggest problem in your life? Okay. So what is the hardest part of taking action or making a decision to solve it? And I'm not seeing any answers. Okay. Trevor, maybe the number, the code, if they can see the code once again, uh, sure. maybe some of them were not able to yep. get that. We can leave that here. So here's the numbers to join guys. And then I can just flip the questions from those slides. Great, great suggestion. Okay, great. Now we're getting some answers. This is cool. Let me turn on the clock for, uh, for another 30 seconds. Okay, fear of failure, fear, peace of mind. We see past experience, we see fear, courage. Okay, our 28 plus is coming up with some great answers over here, everybody. Wow. Okay, this is brilliant. 10 more seconds, guys, 10 more seconds to answer this. And then we're going to come back and, and we're going to look at it in a minute. Okay. So yeah, Trevor, it's so interesting that uh, 
something that we had discussed on on the preparation call that is reflective over here that's the uncertainty right the fear of what may come next that's super interesting sure, sure. i think we're going to we're going to jump deeper into that in a little bit as well okay so let's move on to the next question guys and the next question is who is influencing your decisions the most right now about that very important decision that you're trying to make Actually, I'm going to speak for more than 20 minutes, obviously, but I'll keep it to under 30, okay? Hey, no, no, don't worry about that. I'm sure people are enjoying it. Okay. Social media, parents, friends, and close ones. Parents, circumstances, fear. Okay. My mind, failure. Who is influencing your, the 28 pluses? Uh, my inner critic, opinion of others, teachers, family, myself, colleagues, parents, family, parents. It's okay. Uh, clock is on for 30 seconds. We'll do 30 more seconds. And then we're going to sort of go age group by, by age group and, and take a look here. Okay, 20 more seconds, guys. We seem to be slowing down. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Wow. Really interesting. Okay. So I'm going to go back on the 15 to, uh, to 22 year olds here and just try to take, take a look and see how do I present? I just want to present it and see what happened. Okay. So you don't have to submit any more. I just want to see what were our 15 to 22 year olds saying was the most important life question they were trying to answer. How do I become consistent in life career? What am I going to do in life? You guys are going to hear my kids crying in the background. <laughs> uh, are you happy with your career choice? Okay, good. What were the 20, 15 to 22 year olds saying is the hardest part of taking action or making a decision to solve it? Addiction to phone, very interesting. Confidence, fear, fear of failure, confusion, failure. Okay, so, you know, fear is obviously a center, a center part of this with other aspects circling around. And for the 15 to 22 year olds, who is influencing your decision the most? Parents, uh, families there, friends, mother, but parents is a, is a big one in the middle. Okay, great. Thank you very much, 15 to 22 year olds. That's really useful. And we're gonna come back to that in a minute. Now let's take a look uh, for the 22 to 28 year olds. What is the most important life, life question you are trying to answer right now? What do I want to do next? Job and relationship. What is my purpose in life? What am I doing with my life? How to have a successful and happy life? How to succeed in my career? So it looks to me like some of these questions are already starting to be a little bit more internal than what we saw in the 15 to 22 crowd, but also much more focused on personal agency. Okay, what else do we see? For the 22 to 28 year olds, what's the hardest part of taking action or making a decision to solve it? And again, we see fear, we see confidence, confusion. So actually almost the exact same words that we see in the 15 to 22 year old space. And finally, who is influencing your decision the most? Family and parents heavily factored in here, but friends, society it actually has a spot here. Very, very interesting, okay? And now let's go to our, our senior crowd here, the 28 pluses, including yours truly. Oh, I should have voted. Anyway, uh, the first question, what is the most important life question you are trying to answer right now? Goal of life, how to focus and connect it to my higher self, my career, have a nice time with my family and loved ones, stable in my profession, relationship and career, okay? What is the hardest part of taking action or making a decision to solve it for our 28 pluses? We have uh, fear of failure, confusion, confidence, and fear. Guys, that's a pretty amazing learning uh, on this call right now, which is for all three categories of the hardest part of making the decision, confusion, fear, fear, failure. We're going to come back to that. And the final one for the 28 pluses who is influencing your decision the most right now? Family, myself, 
and friends. So actually in the 28 plus crowd, we see the emergence of myself now and me as a stronger determiner of, of the life choices and who's influencing the decisions. And I think that's also some interesting learning for us. So, okay. Uh, Akshay, that actually turned out better than, than we thought. And I think there's a lot we can learn from here. And I'm going to jump back into my presentation uh, and start to unpack this a little bit. But first and foremost, thank you everybody for your honesty and your attempt at helping us with this exercise. I appreciate it. Go back to full screen. Okay. So before I, I, I go on, what I think is important to see is that it's not necessarily only about the overlap from those three different age groups of what people are focused on. I think one of the most important takeaways is at every stage of life, you're going to feel pressure about making good decisions and about having a clear goal for the decisions that you're making. It doesn't matter if you're 15 years old. It doesn't matter if you're 70 years old. There's always this sense of self, which is, am I making the right decisions to get me to where I have to go? Uh, and I think that's an important takeaway. I think oftentimes young people feel like they're just going to reach a certain stage of life, maybe around 30 or 35, where all the big decisions will have been made and things will start to level off and not be as complicated. They'll still be exciting, but the complexity will start to diminish. And I think uh, if you speak to anybody who is that age or older, it, it, that doesn't happen. Life gets more complex. The hope is you are rising to that complexity and able to embrace it in new ways because you're maturing, but life never stops getting complex. The other thing that I think is a unique takeaway from the exercise we just did is, is seeing how everybody felt at that central stage, which is what prevents you from making those strong decisions or what's getting in the way of making those decisions. And we saw fear, we saw a lack of confidence come up several times. And we're going to touch on this as we get close to the end of the presentation. So again, I really thank everybody for uh, engaging with us for that exercise and we'll come back to it. So I wanted to map it out a little bit. I, I had some guesses before we did the mentee on what some of those answers would be. And I just wanted to plot this out in a way that, that made sense. And actually this 28 plus should say, or 2840 should just say 28 plus. I initially had more age groups, but I, I forgot to change that. So as we saw for the 15 to 22 year olds, it's passing exams, where to study, what to study, how to start a career, et cetera. For the 22 to 28 year olds, it's more about career. We start looking at relationships, the future. For the 28 plus, much more about career, family, stability, et cetera, et cetera. And I just wanted to visually demonstrate how, how we all might be feeling at these stages to again, drive home the point that it's similar. So if you're a 15 to 22 year old, in, in the context of your family, this is you. However, even though you have ideas about what you want to do or how you want to act or the things you want to attempt, you're not the only one making decisions for your future. You also have a strong influence from your parents engaged in this process as well. And this is especially so in, in countries here in, in Southeast Asia and South Asia and, and in India. So, you know, everybody wants to be a topper. Everybody wants to go to IIT Delhi. Everybody, you know, wants to be an engineer or a doctor, or a lawyer, whatever it is. And the reason why, one of the main reasons why people want to do that is not because they want to do that, but they feel like they should do that. But why do they feel like they should do it? Because they, they have this understanding that if they get to the top school, they, get, they study a top profession, it's somehow going to make it easier for them to make it to this next stage. And it's not just about getting to this next stage that it will make easier, but it will guarantee success and happiness onto this subsequent stage as well. The problem is that puts a lot of pressure on a 15 to 17 year old to try to make an incredible decision that has to happen. And if it doesn't happen, the rest of their life will somehow be a failure and, and not exist. So if you're putting that kind of pressure on yourself, at a young age to make that important of a decision, it's gonna be very difficult. Now, this is not only the case with our 15 to 22 year olds. If you're a 22 to 28 year old, you probably look a little bit more like this as you're getting older, you're out in the world, you're working in. 
mom and dad are still there. They're just getting a little bit older and they definitely have a say in the decisions you're making, but they no longer have the final say in the decisions you're making. And so oh, I'm reading the comments. Good. I'm happy this is resonating with some of you guys. So let's say you're already working uh, and you have a career underway and it's time to make a life decision. You're feeling that, that sense in yourself that it's time to make a change. So what do you do? You're thinking of moving cities and you're thinking of changing, uh, changing jobs. Now, as you're making this decision, you're very aware that if you can make the right decision, it's going to set you up for success into the next stage of your life. So it's going to make all of these other things happening when you're 28 and older somehow easier to accomplish. But, you know, you're already in your mid-20s. You don't want to make a mistake. You have a career going. Should you just stay and keep it going? Or should you shake things up and try to make a splash and do something new? And it's not just about that next stage of life you're worried about. You're also worried about what's going to come next. So, again, we're putting a lot of pressure on ourselves to make one decision in one moment of time as if we, we need to have the clearest vision that this decision has to be correct in order for us to succeed. And I, I just wanted to be autobiographical for a second because I'm now into this, into this next stage. <laughs> and I can tell you guys, so uh, we can pretend this is me without a beard. Uh, I know, looks 20 years younger. So this is me. And now I'm the one responsible for the decisions for my life. But not only that, I'm also responsible for the lives of my children and my wife. Of course, my wife and I are co-responsible for the decisions of our family. So at this stage of life as well, it's everything that came before in these previous screens, plus my kid's future. Uh, I, I worry about my parents. There's more work to do, et cetera, et cetera. So if I want to make a decision, of course, first and foremost, my parents are still trying to influence it. But beyond that, if you want to start a family or make big decisions when you already have a small family, it puts a lot of pressure because you really need to make sure that you make a strong decision if you want to change careers or change countries, whatever it is, that you have to make such a strong decision so you can get to this next phase. And it's not only this next phase, you guys know where I'm going with this, okay? So it puts a lot of pressure on somebody to make the right decision in the moment. So I can see from hashtag relatable in the comments that this is starting to hit home. So I want us to do something that's never been done before on a heartfulness web call. I want everybody to raise your right hand and we're going to do a collective face palm. Okay. On the count of three, hand up. One, two, three. Okay. How do <laughs> you guys raised your hand? That's so funny. <laughs> Oh, you guys are great. So how do we take the pressure off ourselves? How do we stop putting this insane pressure on ourselves in the moment to make the perfect decision? Because we, we have no crystal ball. Ultimately, as you go through life, you have to make decisions with imperfect knowledge, but you have to learn to trust yourself in the making of those decisions. So how do we do that? The way we do it, guys, is to begin with the end in mind, but to do it very practically, okay? So let's go back to my key takeaways. First, chillax. You don't have to know what you're doing with your life, but you have to be committed to figuring it out every day. Two, as you start to get an inkling that there's a correct direction to go, you have to take a first step. Nothing is going to convince you that, the next, that that step is correct. You just have to be bold one day and take that step. But trust in the process, try and fail is better than failing to try, okay? That first step is always the hardest. And then three, reflection for the win. The only way to get better at making good choices for your life is to start making choices for your life and then actively reflect on them. Experience plus active reflection is the best and only hack if you don't yet know super clearly who or what you want to be. Now let's go a little bit deeper into all of these. First, how not to chillax. But Trevor by, I don't know what I want to do. And I know some of you guys are reading this. And when I give the three takeaways, you're going, yes, 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 that's true. And then you go, but this guy doesn't know that I, I just don't know what I want to do. And I'm going to be honest. Uh, I'm a straight shooter. My response to you is that's probably BS. Uh, most people actually know what they want to do. 
but they're really afraid of making that decision because it usually goes against what they think they should do. And what they should do typically has clear avenues of either financial security or social security. That's either the approval of their families, the approval of their friends, or the approval of the communities that they live in. Now, I'm, I'm not somebody who's saying, don't go to business school and go be an artist. No, you know, I, I love being a businessman. You know, I'm trying to always find more opportunities to do business. So for some people, business is their path. But for some people, their family might be trying to get them to go be a doctor or an engineer or something else and business is what they want to do or art. And so they don't do it because they don't want to be ostracized from their families or their aunties or their uncles, et cetera. So most people already know, but they don't because they're afraid and they prioritize what they think they should do. So you're listening to this and you might say, okay, but Trevor by, how do I know it's the right choice? I mean, let, let's say I already know what I want to do, but is that the right choice? You know, I don't want to make the wrong choice and then all these things will happen. And again, I'm going to say what I said earlier in the presentation, which is you're still looking at all of these decisions as the decision. What I'm going to advocate ultimately for in the final stage is that not every life decision is actually the decision. They are all a decision. So this linear way of thinking puts way too much pressure on us to make perfect decisions all the time. And it's actually a fallacy. It's not factual. It's not a great way to go through life. So my response to that is, you know, you don't know if it's the right decision, actually. You have to feel it. If it feels right, you have to take a step. But the sooner you make the decision, the sooner you'll know. And look back across your life with all the decisions you made that felt like they were the decision. After you made the decision and you got a week into it or a few months into it, you could make more decisions. There are very few decisions in life that are not changeable. There are some that are changeable or some that when you do change, they have consequences. But more often than not, the kinds of decisions we're talking about here are moving cities or changing careers or going back to school. Those are all chapters in a life. They're not definitive, okay? So you make a choice, you feel it out, you see what happens next. So I wanna, I wanna now shift to that second takeaway. And that second takeaway was more about like, you know, be bold, don't psych yourself out. At some step, you're going to have to just, or at some stage, you're going to have to step up and take that first step. And you're going to have to do it more likely than not with imperfect knowledge. So as I say, the best thing to do is just take, take one decision and see how you feel about it. Okay. If it still feels good, if it still feels like you're starting to go in the right direction, then you swing the hammer again and you go a little bit further into that direction. And if it's still feeling good, if you're starting to see a vision for what you're doing emerge, you may not have had a clear vision in the beginning, but if you're starting to see a vision emerge, you gotta swing the hammer again. And at each stage, if you're checking in with yourself as you're making these decisions, not only do you get the confidence to swing the hammer again, but the results of taking those steps becomes clearer and clearer and clearer. Okay, so there are so few people in life who know exactly what they want to do at a young age. And I'm going to share a quick personal story. When I was a senior in high school in 2007, uh, one of the guys that was in my, in my peer group was our, val well, he was our valedictorian for seven out of eight high school semesters. And in the eighth semester, he was surpassed. And he actually didn't know about it. And I didn't know about it. And we went to the office to, uh, to do some paperwork. And out of like one of the secretaries who was a really funny lady, we were just chit-chatting with her. And she said to him, she goes, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry with what happened recently. We were all rooting for you. And he goes, what do you mean? She goes, oh, well, she said a bad word. She goes, oh, S-H-I-T. You didn't know? And he goes, no, what? She goes, you were surpassed at the end of last semester for valedictorian. This other guy beat him out by taking other classes. And this was not a particularly humble person. Okay, this guy that I knew. And he and I, we, we clashed a lot. And he did one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. He completely composed himself in that moment. And he, and he said to her, he goes, it's okay. I'm going to be the, the I'll, I'm just going to go ahead and be the valedictorian of my, of my uh, medical school. And I kid you not, last year, he was the valedictorian of his medical school. So he is so much the rare individual 
that has that clear vision from a young age, knows exactly what he wants to do, sets himself up to do it, and then goes and does it. My life has been the exact opposite of that. I just swing the hammer a little bit, reflect, and go. And I've been amazed to watch him develop over the years. But again, he's so rare. He's even rarer than Steve Jobs, <laughs> okay? It's impossible to give this presentation without talking about this quote from Steve Jobs, who he says this clearer than anybody. You can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. You have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. So you start with some idea of a vision, but you start making some smaller decisions. You swing the hammer. And as the vision appears, you follow it. And if it's not working, you stop swinging the hammer and, and you try something else. But the key thing is do a little bit each time, reflect and see what happens, okay? So this is gonna take us uh, close to the, the end of the presentation or to the Q&A. And you know, 30 minutes, guys, is not a long time at all to talk about a subject like this. And it's such a shame because it's really one direction. It's not bilateral as a conversation. And uh, I've said it four other times and I'm gonna say it again. First is please relax. If you take away anything from my presentation today, you probably feel alone and you probably feel a lot of pressure. And I hope if for anything for these 40 minutes you had a smile and you feel less alone and you feel less pressure. You have to learn to relax and to take that pressure off yourself. Two, be bold. When you see the opportunity to make a decision, make that decision. Don't shy away from it. Don't call your mom. Don't call your dad. Don't call your aunties. Don't run it by all your friends. Don't post about it on Facebook. You're just giving up the responsibility for a really great opportunity to learn. So be bold. Take that first step. And three, reflection for the win. As you get older and as you're making these decisions, you have to take time to check in with yourself and see how you feel. I am not somebody who has ever had a clear vision for my life, really. Everything I've done, I've done in, in the term they use is stochastic. You take a step, you learn from it. You take a step, you learn from it. So live stochastically. Make a decision. Reflect on it. If it still feels good, make a second decision that's going in that direction. Write it out a little bit. And if it starts to feel wrong, you need to check into that. But don't just make decisions blindly or don't keep making decisions without feeling your way through them. And this, this for me has been the only way to live my life because I've never had that uniting vision. In fact, until I had children over the last four years where the health and safety of my children is now number one in what I work towards in, in everything, I was basically just taking a few steps, sometimes two steps forward, three steps back, sometimes three steps forward, one step back. But you gotta take the time to reflect, okay? So with that, everybody, I am going to hand it back over to Akshay for the Q&A. I appreciate you humoring me for the last 40 minutes. This has been good fun. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much, Trevor. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to ask some uh, questions that, you know, it came up. Uh, what's the best method to reorient myself to begin with the end in mind instead of the regular thought patterns that we had before? I think it's just to ask yourself a simple question. If you had none of your current responsibilities or expectations on you, what would you be doing? You know, if you, if you had the opportunity and uh, to just restart everything and go fully in the direction you wanted, where would you go? And I know you know the answer to that question. You might be embarrassed by it. You might have been pushing it down for so many years and it might be something ridiculous, but I know you know the answer to that question. Every, everybody does. So, uh, you know, trust that. Second, as you start trying to make decisions and you feel that fear coming up, ask yourself, what are you really afraid of? Because almost none of us are in physical danger. And if you are in physical danger, my heart goes out to you. And that's beyond the purview of this conversation, right? If you can't make decisions because there's physical danger, there's a whole other aspect to it. But for the vast majority of us, there's a perception of danger 
which is we're going to be kicked out of our families or our friends won't talk to us or, you know, our mom will cry or something. Is it really going to end a relationship? You know, is your mom really going to never speak to you again if you like decide to study something else? You know, is that really going to happen? So dig into that fear and see like, oh yeah, my friends will never talk to me, but if I'm living my best life, do I care if people who are not on board with that stop talking to me or if I stop hanging out with them? You know, so really question that fear. And I think you'll start to realize that there's just this layer of BS that comes up because we're a human being, but you're already clear on where you want to go and start to push past it. Yeah, that actually, uh, it all came, it all started making sense to me when I was thinking about my situation right now when you were speaking. And that's so interesting. I'm 25 and uh, I'm looking at going for further school, right? So, yeah. <laughs> That, that's really, that put things in perspective. The next question that we have is, how long-term should my goals be? Can there be a multi, like multiple ends for any particular event or timeline? How should we decide that? I'm not super clear on the question or the intent behind the question. It's, you know, I guess it's saying, well, I, I think based on the book, the longer term your vision, the better, because then you can set it yourself up for more of those linear decisions. However, I think it's good to bookend some of this if you don't have a long term vision. And, you know, for some people, it's just, you know, by the end of the semester, I really want to get a certain grade point average, but I want to make sure that, like, I'm talking to five new people a day or I, you know, I learn to play the guitar better. Or, you know, I want to volunteer my time more, or I want to grow spiritually or, or something. So it's good to use shorter timelines to make some of these long-term goals achievable. And there's no harm in doing that. I, 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 actually, I think that's the spirit of the question. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that actually, I guess, it also addresses the next question, which says, does the beginning with the end set ourselves on a fixed path? leading to losing out on the other options or opportunities? Well, at, at some point in life, we all have to understand that there's opportunity costs. You cannot do everything ever. You have to make decisions. And, and this is one of the most heartbreaking or seemingly heartbreaking parts of growing up is because we want to do so much. We want to be so many things. But actually, again, if you return to that first question I just answered here, you've probably ever only really wanted to do two or three things. And the sooner you can start to work on those decisions and just try, then either you can continue down that path and you'll be loving it so much because at each step of the way, you're reflecting on it. And if at each stage you're still loving it, why would you want to change? You don't have to go do everything. You're still enjoying doing it so much. But if you had start, if you stop enjoying it at some stage, then you know, okay, this is no longer for me. I need to start trying something else. You just start being somebody else, and that that's that's also okay. Uh, I, I I we received a very interesting question, and I really wanted to put this one forward because it revolves around or it mentions the piece of the word failure that we saw on so many of the mentees. So that, that seems like a common uh, topic. The question goes, how do you deal with fear of failure when it is something you have experienced before, especially mental health? Well, that's a really good question. And, you know, for, first is, that that second takeaway. So I'm 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 not a doctor and I'm not a mental health professional. The the first layer of this is, you know, but I have I am somebody. I have been to therapy when I was a kid. I had a psych a psychologist. He's actually the first person I ever meditated with. Incredible story for another time. So I'm I'm a strong believer in the power of of mental health and in therapy and that is a question too that should be included with mental health professionals. But let's talk about my second takeaway of the day, which is this idea of you got to have confidence. Ultimately, we have to make decisions for our lives. 
And if you can start to make some small decisions, but again, reflect on them, start with the small decisions first and build up that, that confidence. And you saw in the word cloud, it wasn't just fear, but confidence came up at every stage. So the only way you can have confidence, if you don't have that super clear vision, like my schoolmate when I was a kid, the only way to have confidence in your vision is to continually test it and to make sure it feels okay. And if you have a fear of making those decisions, then you have to start to identify what are some of the smaller decisions you can make to test that larger hypothesis. So like, let's say you want to go back to school and, and study business, but you're currently doing only accounting or you're doing design. So instead of just dropping everything and starting full on to apply to your MBAs and take the exams, which is what a lot of people will do, or actually they think that's what they'll have to do and they get so overwhelmed that they don't actually take the step, but they feel a lot of anxiety about it is, how about you just take like a free online course like through Coursera or at, at, at one of the local universities to test to see if it's something you're really interested in and make those small steps. Now, if, if the mental health part is really a concern, as you go through new changes in life, I, I always say, you know, therapy is something that's never done. If you feel like, you know, you have a therapist who you trust or you need to find somebody to speak about, book an appointment and go talk to them about it. Just say, hey, you know, in, in the past when I made a decision like this, I would, didn't wind up in a good place and I'm, I'm facing a similar decision now. Uh, here's how I'm approaching it. What do you think? And, you know, those two or three sessions could be really beneficial for helping you navigate that, that period of your life. That's really interesting. That's a very sound um, guidance, I'd like to say. Uh, one common question, another common question was, how, 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 we, how do we influence, avoid influence of society uh, in our decisions? Great. I think we're going to sort of touch on that more towards the end when, when we actually meditate. But the, the, for me, you know, I think we've all had this amazing experience where, you know, you, you go to Facebook and I don't have the, I don't have the newsfeed available on my computer, but it's available on my phone On my computer. I block it out. But I, when I do go to Facebook on my phone, I see the newsfeed. And sometimes, you know, somebody who I haven't thought of in, in 15 years, like somebody from high school or middle school or just so long in my past, I just scroll by their picture. But that night or the following night, I somehow have a dream about them. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is that we've all had this experience, whether it's you see a billboard and then suddenly you think of it later or you see somebody's face on Facebook, these things get inside us. So first is you have to be really mindful of your inputs. You know, if you're watching, you know, like a marathon episode day after day of Mad Men or other like, you know, corporate success TV shows or, or dramas, and you suddenly find yourself wanting to be getting more money and more powerful and wishing you had a better job and more responsibility, you know, pay, pay attention to that. If you're watching, you know, whatever it is, shows about living the high life or, or anything else. So pay attention to your inputs. I always, people say you are what you eat. And I always say you think what you see. So, you know, if you're going to watch a lot of things, if you're going to con consume a lot of media, make sure it's the right media, because that will have an impact on you. But second, and again, this goes back to the, 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 the question at the very beginning. This first question is, if you're spending that time reflecting and if you're being honest with what you really want, you start to make peace with the fact that the world might be saying one thing, but you know in your heart another thing. And the only way to get that is have the clear vision from the beginning or build confidence by reflecting on your decisions along the way. That's interesting. So, so how we have, maybe we can stretch our time for maybe a couple sure. of two questions because these are some really key questions. One of them is, is it okay to not have an end goal? Well, I don't think that that question was being asked as like a, as like a funny question. I think, I think it's probably an honest question. And it's probably more related to like career. 
like, hey, like I don't really what I want to know what I want to do with my career. I'm just kind of having fun studying right now. Or I just kind of enjoy what I'm doing. I'm not thinking too much about the future. And, and I'll say that's okay, but it's probably only along the lines of one domain, career or job or school or something. And I would say that's fine, but I'm sure there's another domain in life where you are looking at excellency. It could be video gaming. It could be, you know, a hobby that you have, woodworking. It could be, you know, maybe you're active in the life, in the life of like your, your niece or your nephew. But I guarantee there's one area of life where you are striving for mastery. And that's okay. Your end goal doesn't have to be your career. I know, I know many people who for them, a job is just a job. They really don't care what they do but they have a whole other aspect of their life, whether it's piano lessons or their garden or something else that that is where they put their time and their energy and where they have more focus and direction. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, one of the question was, uh, actually, that's actually, really, yeah, actually, can, can I touch on that question from Vidi about the pandemic? Cause I think that's really important. Sure. Definitely. Please go ahead. So Vidi, really great question. And, and I was expecting something like this and, and the way you asked it as well is, is really on point. So I'm just gonna read your question so everybody can, can hear it. So while the vision was clear and was working towards it, but this unprecedented pandemic has brought things a bit to a standstill and is becoming a major influence on how to move further. So couldn't agree more. I think we all had a lot of plans in place and COVID-19 came out of nowhere and just knocked us all out and knocked all of our plans astray. So in the way that I did it, and, and I just had our executive board meeting for my business last week. And, and what I said was we need to reframe all of these losses as opportunities. And the first opportunity here is to reflect and say, do I still believe in the direction that I'm going? So if, if the, like the pandemic to me is a pause, it's a timeout, it's just stopped everything and brought total chaos. But it's also this opportunity to reflect on the decisions that we've made that have brought us to this moment and to say, do I still believe in the direction that I'm going? If that answer is yes, then the pandemic doesn't matter because you'd be willing to wait or do whatever you can to advance that mission in whatever way you can going forward. I know a few people on this call right now are supposed to be going to either the States or the Europe to do master's degrees or PhDs starting in, in, in September. And that's just not gonna happen right now. Or there's no clarity about whether or not that's gonna happen. But I can guarantee that they are starting to get their syllabi from their teachers. They're starting to order their books. They're starting to do that reading so they're even more prepared than, than they may have even been had they been going in September because they still believe in that vision. So they're taking some action in that direction. So Vidi, I don't know specifically your situation, but my only answer is to use this time as a rich, delicious pause to reflect and to make sure that you still believe in that vision. And if you still believe in that vision, even if it seems like it's gonna be canceled and there's no way going forward, you'll find a way somehow to push it forward. Or if it doesn't feel right, you might say, oh, thank God this happened. I was about to make a huge mistake. <laughs> Time to, to make another decision. But again, you've gone through that process of reflection. So Trevor, we have an interesting question. Uh, Joy Surya is asking, what do you mean by reflection exactly? And how do you do that? Who asked that question? Joy Surya. The Surya. You are a mind reader. Let's do it. Okay. So there are so many different ways to reflect. And, you know, one of the best and the simplest, just standing up from your computer and going for a walk, God forbid, you know, taking a daily walk, writing in a diary, uh, reading, nourishing books. Everybody has different ways of relaxing themselves and reflecting. Obviously, this is a webinar that's happening on heartfulness, and heartfulness represents an approach to meditation. In my opinion, I've been meditating for 13 years. I've been, a, or I've been meditating for 15 years, 13 years in heartfulness, and, uh, and 10 years now, a decade as a heartfulness trainer. I believe that 
really any meditation, not doesn't have to be harmfulness, but any systematic and daily meditation is one of the best ways to reflect with yourself because naturally through the process of meditation, if something is going well, you're going to hear about it and it's going to give you confidence. And if something's not going well, you're going to hear about it and it may make you feel a little bad because you don't feel good about it, but it's going to give you confidence to make a change in your life, to start to remove those negative uh, influences. So meditation is not the only, is not the only way. And I want to be clear, any systematic method done daily for reflection, an hour of journaling, 20 minutes of writing, uh, you know, taking that afternoon walk at the same time every day for the same amount of time to ask yourself how you feel. The key thing here is systematically. I'm an advocate for meditation because I've been doing it for so long and it's had such a profound impact on my life, but it's not the only way. Now, frankly, I'm not a certified uh, walk taker. I'm not a certified journaler. I'm not a diary trainer. I'm a meditation trainer. And so when I'm asked to do uh, a presentation like this, I would like to share with everybody that process of reflection and to give us a chance to actually do it together. So if you guys want to, what we can do is we can uh, do a five minute guided relaxation, which will just kind of help us get out of the craziness of our minds to a place more centered in our heart. And then we can meditate there for about 15 minutes. Actually, do you think that'd be good? And, and I can explain how to meditate as well. That sounds good. Uh, I had one very profound question that I, I think that's super tangible. So if you'd like to just take this last one, the question is, how can we not get discouraged by our parents' mentalities? <laughs> oh, it's getting hot in here, guys. This is a tough question to uh, to answer to uh, to a, a mostly Southeast Asian and South Asian audience, because uh, you know I I grew up in a in freedom country. Not kidding. Uh, no, in in all seriousness, first you should listen to your parents. Okay. Uh, nine times out of 10, 10 times out of 10, parents actually actually want what's best for you. Even if it seems sometimes like they have their own ego caught up in it. Most of, the, most of the time, it's because they love you and they're worried about you. And, and they have a lot of experience in the world. They've seen things go up and down. And you know, most parents want their kids to be okay. I know I, I certainly feel that way about my kids. But if if you strongly believe your life should be another way, you have to do that calculus of, you know, this is going to make my parents really upset, but I need to follow, I need to follow my heart and I have to do it. And, and you have to do it. And I'll share autobiographically, if I may, Akshay. You know, when I first graduated college, I had a job at Google. And, you know, at the time, Google was the the top, top company to get to. It was like 13 times harder to get a job at Google than into Harvard. And, you know, uh, my family was so proud. My friends were so proud. And I mean, Google was amazing in terms of the, the pay, in terms of the food, in terms of the, the quality of my colleagues. So much about it was, was amazing. But being honest with you guys, I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. I knew in, in the first week of being there that it was not a place for me. And, you know, I'm not like a corporate guy. I don't do well in a big corporate environment. I didn't like having only a very focused, narrow task. I like to be thinking big. I like to be making decisions. And when I shared with my parents in the first basically couple of weeks that I wasn't satisfied and that I honestly believed it was the wrong fit, I'd been better off, you know, quitting and trying to find another job. It was the first time ever they got like, like my parents were super hands off with me for the first 23 years of my life in terms of the decisions I made, they were very supportive. They were actively against it. You can't quit a job so soon. This is your first job. You're just not mature enough yet. All first jobs feel like this. My heart was screaming, no, this is not for you. I would wake up in the morning and, and I felt such like a pressure in my chest that this is not for me. It took me 18 months to leave that job. And the reason why, the only reason why I didn't leave earlier was because I felt like I was disappointing my parents. And I'll tell you what, <laughs> I never wanna do that again. I never wanna waste 18 months like that because at the end of the day, I've lived a great life since then and things, things took off after I made that decision. It wasn't easy, I failed in a business, 
I moved cities three times. I got married and didn't have a job. Then I got fired while my wife was pregnant. I mean, all of these things have happened. But by making those decisions for me, things took off. And, uh, you know, my parents still love me and we're still really close. So I hope, I hope that answers. That's about as honest as I can be with several hundred strangers. I mean, that's, wow, that, that gives so much, uh, that, that feels good to hear that, that you have to, at the end of the day, you have to trust yourself and have that confidence, yeah? It's also too, I mean, you guys see me as a 31 year old with all of his SHIT together. He's got a big job, he's got a family and kids and he can do these webinars, but you're not seeing all the steps that I took to get here and that all of these other aunties and uncles took to get to their positions of success either. None of it was line them up, knock them down, line them up. No, most lives, Steve Jobs, <laughs> right? You only know when you're looking, when you're looking back. So cool. All right. So yeah, let's, let's go on to the step on how to actually make this tangible, how to bring this to life. Okay. So, um, I'm, I think most people on call are probably familiar with, with how to meditate. And I'm just going to give a brief, a brief, uh, introduction. So as you heard me say so many times during this presentation, and I say it just because it's a feature of, of English, you know, you have to listen to the heart. You have to focus on the heart. How do you feel? Heartfulness meditation by definition is a meditation that leverages the wisdom and the inner dialogue that we have going on all the time in our heart. The thing is, most of the time, we're so busy up here that we don't pay attention to what's actually happening down here. So in very simple terms, what we're going to do is I'm going to play a YouTube video for everybody that's going to take us guided step by step through checking in with different parts of our body and just relaxing. Takeaway number one, chillax, relax. After that's done, you'll hear me say, please begin meditation. And when I say that, I just want you to bring your attention to the heart and I want you to have a thought that there's a source of light inside the heart. Now, please keep your eyes closed and please sit in whatever position is maximally comfortable for you. If you're not comfortable sitting with your legs crossed on the ground, please don't sit like that because you won't be meditating on your heart. You'll be meditating on your legs and your feet falling asleep. Instead, like me, I sit in a chair. Just sit comfortably, close your eyes, and bring your attention to the heart. Especially if this is your first time meditating, you're gonna be flying all over the place. You're gonna be thinking about some of the things I said. You're gonna be thinking about that big life decision, <laughs> whatever it is, or whatever his name is, or her name is. You're gonna be thinking about your parents. You're gonna be thinking, whatever it is, when you recognize that you're thinking of something else, this is the one time give, that you should give yourself permission not to kick your own butt and be like, oh, I'm meditating right now. I'm even so bad at this. No. Just be gentle. Say, okay, I'm thinking about the, the promotion that I want to get at work, but actually I should be meditating. I'm going to let that thought go, and I'm just going to come back to this idea of light in the heart. So whenever you find you're going in a different direction, just say, okay, that's cool. I'm meditating right now, though. Thank you, thought. I want to come back to the light in the heart. Okay, that's as basic of an introduction as I can give. And then I think uh, after the meditation, after about 15 minutes, you'll hear me say, that's all. And at that point, Akshay, you'll come on for final thoughts, correct? Sounds good. Okay. So I'm going to stop my, oh, actually, I did want to say one more thing. So when I said, let's practice this together, just before you meditate. Now, please don't meditate on this question, but a really great feature of meditation is the fact that you can ask your heart questions and just pay attention to what the answer is. So as we begin meditating, whatever that most important question that you answered earlier on the mentee is in your life, ask it to your heart. Don't try to get an answer and don't request that your heart gives you an answer. But you can just say like, heart, you know, I'm having a really hard time deciding where I should move next or what I should go back and study or if I should actually bring this topic up with my parents. Please give me guidance when you can. 
just ask your heart that question. Then put the idea of light in your heart and start to meditate. I'm not saying your heart is going to tell you exactly the answer to that question, but this is the beginning of you starting to have that stronger relationship with your heart and being open to it either telling you what to do or what not to do. But it starts by just asking. You have to ask questions in order to get answers. Now, don't sit there and be like, important question, important question, important question. You'll have a headache. You won't get the answer. That's not the point, but you can ask the question and then meditate as normal and just see what happens, okay? So with that, I will go to the guided relaxation and then I will move us to a 15 minute meditation. Okay. Can you guys still see my screen? Yep, okay. screen. And actually, can you let me know if you can hear when you when the sound comes on. Okay. Uh, I don't think it's on the heartfulness guided oh, relaxation. Okay. Find a comfortable position. Close your eyes. Allow your breath to be normal and calm. Relax. Let's begin with the toes. Bring your attention to your toes. And begin to feel your toes relaxing. Your toes now feel more relaxed than they have ever felt before. Now feel your feet and let them deeply relax. Feel your ankles. All tension is leaving your ankles. Relax, breathe in and let go. And then move to your lower legs. Feel them relax now too. Breathe in gently and relax. Move to the upper legs the upper legs feel totally relaxed. Now the whole legs feel relaxed. From the top of your legs to the tip of your toes, feeling relaxed. Breathe in and let go. Bring your attention to your buttocks and hips. Release any tension you may be holding there. Relax. Breathe in and let go. Move your attention to your abdomen. Feel your abdomen muscles begin to relax and let go. Breathe in and let go. Relax. Moving up into the chest. Breathe in and let go. The entire chest area is relaxing now. Bring your attention to your back. Beginning with your lower back. Breathe calmly, slowly. Relax and let go of all tension in your lower back. 
Moving on to the upper back. Release any tension you hold there and just relax. Your back area is now completely relaxed. Then draw your attention to your fingertips. Relax your fingertips. Relax your hands. Your lower arms are relaxed. The upper arms are feeling deeply relaxed now. Breathe in and let go. And now relax the shoulders. The shoulders are relaxing and melting away. Begin to relax the neck. Release any tightness in the neck muscles. Relax. Breathe calmly. Releasing all tension from your neck. Move your attention to your face. Relax. Your jaws begin to relax. The lips are relaxed. Eyes are closed very gently and very softly. Relax. Now move up into your mind, feeling deeply relaxed inside, breathing calmly. Allow your mind to relax. Now move your attention towards your heart. Relax into your heart and now just remain there, feeling deeply relaxed in your heart. <clears throat> Please begin meditation.
That's all. Thank you so much, Trevor. Uh, would, you, would, you, would you like to uh, enunciate on the takeaways once again? Well, I, uh, I just hope everybody had <clears throat> as beautiful a meditation as I just did. And, you know, you guys heard me say this enough. So, uh, more importantly, thank everybody, really. I had a, a really wonderful time putting this presentation together as well as interacting with the, uh, the youth team doing this. Uh, it's been so lovely over the last couple weeks getting to know you guys. And that means a lot to me. And I hope it meant a lot to you too. So thank you everybody. And really, uh, you know, hope we can continue this and do it in new ways and new forms and one day in person as well. Absolutely, Trevor. One a last thing I'd like to mention before we depart for today is that we have a lot of curated content out there on the Facebook group. Uh, we would be putting the link to the Facebook group over here. If uh, you would like to search it yourself, the name of the group is Youth 2.0 Inside Out. Uh, a lot of uh, this, the recording of this video is going to be there uh, and you can have we would rather encourage a healthy discussion about your thoughts, your experiences on this uh, session today. So I request all of you all to, whenever you're free, to go on to a Facebook group and check it out. Also, uh, we would be having a worksheet which would have some very interesting uh, thoughts or questions that you can fill for yourself, maybe write on your journal or your um, diary and you can uh, go deeper into it let's we will see you the coming saturday thank you everybody thank you take care bye bye